of fossil shells and other extraneous fossils by oliver goldsmith seventeen twenty eight to seventeen seventy four from chapter five of a history of the earth and animated nature this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org we may affirm of m buffon that which has been said of the chemists of old though he may have failed in attaining his principal aim of establishing a theory yet he has brought together such a multitude of facts relative to the history of the earth and the nature of its fossil productions that curiosity finds ample compensation even while it feels the want of conviction before therefore i enter upon the description of those parts of the earth which seem more naturally to fall within the subject it will not be improper to give a short history of those animal productions that are found in such quantities either upon its surface or at different depths below it they demand our curiosity and indeed there is nothing in natural history that has afforded more scope for doubt conjecture and speculation whatever depths of the earth we examine or whatever distance within land we seek we most commonly find a number of fossil shells which being compared with others from the sea of known kinds are found to be exactly of a similar shape and nature they are found at the very bottom of quarries and mines in the retired and inmost parts of the most firm and solid rocks upon the tops of even the highest hills and mountains as well as in the valleys and plains and this not in one country alone but in all places where there is any digging for marble chalk or any other terrestrial matters that are so compact as to fence off the external injuries of the air and thus preserve these shells from decay these marine substances so commonly diffused and so generally to be met with were for a long time considered by philosophers as productions not of the sea but of the earth as we find that spars they say always shoot into peculiar shapes so these seeming snails cockles and mussel shells are only sportive forms that nature assumes amongst others of its mineral varieties they have the shape of fish indeed but they have always been terrestrial substances with this plausible solution mankind were for a long time content but upon closer inquiry they were obliged to alter their opinion it was found that these shells had in every respect the properties of animal and not of mineral nature they were found exactly of the same weight with their fellow shells upon shore they answered all the chemical trails in the same manner as sea shells do their parts when dissolved had the same appearance to view the same smell and taste they had the same effects in medicine when internally administered and in a word were so exactly conformable to marine bodies that they had all the accidental concretions growing to them such as pearls corals and smaller shells which are found in shells just gathered from the shore they were therefore from these considerations again given back to the sea but the wonder was how to account for their coming so far from their own natural element upon land as this naturally gave rise to many conjectures it is not to be wondered that some among them have been very extraordinary an italian quoted by m buffon supposes them to have been deposited in the earth at the time of the crusades by the pilgrims who then returned from jerusalem who gathered them upon the seashore in their return carried them to their different places of habitation but this conjecture seems to have but a very inadequate idea of their numbers at touraine in france more than a hundred miles from the sea there is a plain of about nine leagues long and as many broad 
from whence the peasants of the country supply themselves with marl for manuring their lands they seldom dig deeper than twenty feet and the whole plain is composed of the same materials which are shells of various kinds without the smallest portion of earth between them here then is a large space in which are deposited millions of tons of shells which pilgrims could not have collected though their whole employment had been nothing else england is furnished with its beds which though not quite so extensive yet are equally wonderful near reading in berkshire for many succeeding generations a continued body of oyster shells has been found through the whole circumference of five or six acres of ground the foundation of these shells is a hard rocky chalk above this chalk the oyster shells lie in a bed of green sand upon a level as nigh as can possibly be judged and about two feet thickness these shells are in their natural state but they are found also petrified and almost in equal abundance in all the alpine rocks in the pyrenees on the hills of france england and flanders even in all quarries from whence marble is dug if the rocks be split perpendicularly downwards petrified shells and other marine substances will be plainly discerned about a quarter of a mile from the river medway in the county of kent after the taking off the coping of a piece of ground there the workmen came to a blue marble which continued for three feet and a half deep or more and then beneath appeared a hard floor or pavement composed of petrified shells crowded closely together this layer was about an inch deep and several yards over and it could be walked upon as upon a beach these stones of which it was composed the describer supposes them to have always been stones were either wreathed as snails or bivalvular like cockles the wreathed kinds were about the size of a hazelnut and were filled with a stony substance of the color of marl and they themselves also till they were washed were of the same color and when cleaned they appeared of the color of the bazaar and of the same polish after boiling in water they became whitish and left a chalkiness upon the fingers in several parts of asia and africa travelers have observed these shells in great abundance in the mountains of the cross divan which lie above the city of barut they quarry out a white stone every part of which contains petrified fishes in great numbers and of surprising diversity they also seem to continue in such preservation that their fins scales and all the minutest distinctions of their make can be perfectly discerned from all these instances we may conclude that fossils are very numerous and indeed independent of their situations they afford no small entertainment to observe them as preserved in the cabinets of the curious the variety of their kinds is astonishing most of the seashells which are known and many others to which we are entirely strangers are to be seen either in their natural state or in various degrees of petrification in the place of some we have mere spar or stone exactly expressing all the lineaments of animals as having been wholly formed from them for it has happened that the shells dissolving by very slow degrees and the matter having nicely and exactly filled all the cavities within this matter after the shells have perished has preserved exactly and regularly the whole print of their internal surface of these there are various kinds found in our pits many of them resembling those of our shores and many others that are only to be found on the coasts of other countries there are some shells resembling those that are never stranded upon our coasts but that always remain in the deep and many more there are which we can assimilate with no shells that are known amongst us but we find not only shells in our pits but also fishes and corals in great abundance 
together with almost every sort of marine production it is extraordinary enough however that the common red coral though so very frequent at sea is scarcely seen in the fossil world nor is there any account of its ever having been met with but to compensate for this there are all the kinds of the white coral now known and many other kinds of that substance with which we are unacquainted of animals there are various parts the vertebrae of whales and the mouths of lesser fishes these with teeth also of various kinds are found in the cabinets of the curious where they receive long greek names which it is neither the intention nor the province of this work to enumerate indeed few readers would think themselves much improved should i proceed to enumerate the various classes of conocynthidontes polyleptogynglimi or orthoceratitis these names which mean no great matter when they are explained may serve to guide in the furnishing of a cabinet but they are of very little service in furnishing the page of instructive history from all these instances we see in what abundance these petrifactions are to be found and indeed m buffon to whose accounts we have added some has not been sparing in the variety of his quotations concerning the places where they are mostly to be found however i am surprised that he should have omitted the mention of one which in some measure may more than any of the rest would have served to strengthen his theory we are informed by almost every traveller that has described the pyramids of egypt that one of them is entirely built of a kind of free stone in which these petrified shells are found in great abundance this being the case it may be conjectured as we have accounts of these pyramids among the earliest records of mankind and of their being built so long before the age of herodotus who lived but fifteen hundred years after the flood that even the egyptian priests could tell neither the time nor the cause of their erection i say it may be conjectured that they were erected but a short time after the flood it is not very likely therefore that the marine substances found in one of them had time to be formed into a part of the solid stone either during the deluge or immediately after it and consequently their petrifaction must have been before that period and this is the opinion m buffon has all along so strenuously endeavoured to maintain having given specious reasons to prove that such shells were laid in the beds where they are now found not only before the deluge but even antecedent to the formation of man at the time when the whole earth as he supposes was buried beneath a covering of waters but while there are many reasons to persuade us that these extraneous fossils have been deposited by the sea there is one fact that will abundantly serve to convince us that the earth was habitable if not inhabited before these marine substances came to be thus deposited for we find fossil trees which no doubt once grew upon the earth as deep and as much in the body of solid rocks as these shells are to be found some of these fallen trees also have lain at least as long if not longer in the earth than the shells as they have been found sunk deep in a marly substance composed of decayed shells and other marine productions m buffon has proved that fossil shells could not have been deposited in such quantities all at once by the flood and i think from the above instance it is pretty plain that howsoever they were deposited the earth was covered with trees before their deposition and consequently that the sea could not have made a very permanent stay how then shall we account for these extraordinary appearances in nature a suspension of all ascent is certainly the first although the most mortifying conduct for my own part were i to offer a conjecture and all that has been said upon this subject is but conjecture instead of supposing them to be the remains of animals belonging to the sea 
i would consider them rather as bred in the numerous fresh-water lakes that in primeval times covered the face of the uncultivated nature some of these shells we know to belong to fresh waters some can be assimilated to none of the marine shells now known why therefore may we not as well ascribe the productions of all to fresh waters where we do find them as we do that to the latter to the sea only where we never find them we know that lakes and lands also have produced animals that are now no longer existing why therefore might not these fossil productions be among the number i grant that this is making a very harsh supposition but i cannot avoid thinking that it is not attended with so many embarrassments as some of the former and that it is much easier to believe that these shells were bred in fresh water than that the sea had for a long time covered the tops of the highest mountains end of of fossil shells and other extraneous fossils by oliver goldsmith